Previously, as the leader of the gang, Aileron spotted Kadan's garden. She wanted to take a closer look. The gang went into Kadan's garden and wondered what kind of things there were as they had never seen something like that in the homes of either humans or demons. One of them said that it was obvious that someone was tending those fields. Another one tried one of Kadan's crops and he was amazed by the taste. He told everyone to try it and people were about to become addicted. A dark-haired woman informed her boss that she tried surveying the area, and she spotted multiple houses with mysterious architecture at the center of the fields. She concluded that this place wasn't a village, it was a farm. The boss thought this could be the place where aristocrats lived in seclusion, and if what she said was true then they would find their answer to why those fields were spread out in the middle of nowhere. Since they were talking about an aristocrat who was keeping those tasty crops to themselves, there was bound to be valuable treasure deep inside their houses, so if they were to let go of that golden opportunity right in front of them, it would sully their reputation as thieves. They decided to take everything valuable with them. Before they move, the boss lady saw a wolf in the sheds. Meanwhile, Belina was controlling the waypoints. Maintaining the waypoints was vital for Majesty and Astris to visit them, but since her job was to just hum one song, it didn't feel like a worthwhile job to her. That was why she had been lending a hand all over the place. As someone who worked in the archives under the Demon King before coming there, there wasn't much she could manage to do. Now, the three mermaids with them were handling the areas that were lacking manpower so her workload had been decreasing. She seemed uncomfortable for not having enough job to spend her days. She was worried that if this situation continued, she was going to be jobless so she decided to find something to do. She started to look for Kadan to ask for a job. When she found him, he was doing pottery. She didn't know what it was so he explained that he made bowls and such using clay. Since the kitchenware they had were all made of mana metal, he thought it was time they got some genuine ceramics. But hand molding took some time and it needed some reconstruction so it rotates. Hearing the word rotate, she asked him to let her help him as she believed that she could still be used to him. She took out some psychokinesis that she used, and if she invoked magic into those pebbles, she could make objects move. Kidan was surprised so she tried to invoke magic into one and bury it near the edge of the base. Kidan was amazed that it really moved. Although she successfully used the pebbles it was hard to control so she lost control after a while, and the clay went straight on Kidan's face. Kadan praised Belena's hard-working character but she just wanted to work harder since she didn't see herself as good as Batemi or the others. This surprised Kadan as he always thought she was plenty of help. He mentioned that it was thanks to her that the wheel was rotating on its own now. He suggested trying pottery together since she was already there. Belena got super excited and accepted his suggestion. After many tries she was furious that she couldn't manage to do it. Kadan tried to calm her down by saying no one was good at it the first time. Besides, he was willing to find something that he could use the pottery she made. Suddenly they heard some wolves barking and followed their noise wondering what was about. They saw Orkubo with a bunch of people. When he asked for an explanation Orkubo said that they caught a group of elven bandits trespassing on their farm. Kidan didn't know what elves meant so Belena explained that elves were a subspecies of demons. Throughout their history they had branched out as a species of their own. Kidan thought they were Belena's allies but she said that elves were a race that refrains from interacting with either humans or demons and dwells deep within the forests. She had heard there were numerous groups of elven bandits. They had been stealing left and right without disregard for one's race, garnering them infamy among the humans and demons. Apparently they had been taking refuge in the hinterlands where no one dared to go. That does make them hard to capture. Kadan wondered if that meant they'd been living in the steep mountain. He said this place is pretty isolated from the rest of the world. He thought they must be surprised, stumbling upon their farm situated in the middle of nowhere. The boss asked, what exactly is this place? And who was he? Belina introduced Kidan to elves and said that he was the owner of that settlement. One of her allies claimed that Kidan seemed like a human, so that would mean they were in the human territory. But then they were confused as his attendant was a demon and even the rest of the residents were monsters. Not only that they were mutated species with superhuman strength and were capable of speech, so they think this definitely must be within the demon's territory which means they were captured by the demon race. Kidan asked if elves did something and Orkubo said that they snitched their tomatoes on their farm. Platy appeared angry and Vale came next to her, turned into her real form and was ready to kill them. Platy said this was a prime concern to them, and they shouldn't let these thieves go unpunished. There would be no guarantee that they can protect their precious field the next time that happens. Vale agreed, as that was where they should give the death penalty to show others what would happen if they intruded on their fields and suggested hanging their corpses out in the open. Elves, including the boss, started to freak out thinking that would be the end for them. One of them mentioned themselves as the Thunderstorm Stonecutters and Belina remembered that she had come across that name in the archives before. It was said that their group only targeted the rich nobles and merchants, and they would never steal from the poor. The aristocrats they were after were usually the corrupt type who would fill their pockets with unreasonable taxes and brides. 
The nobles whose misdeeds were exposed by their actions had been disgraced by Demon King Zidane. Vale didn't care about their work ethic and wanted them all dead. Kadan thought about it for a moment and decided that Platy was right and that is why he was going to impose a sentence on that theft case. However, his punishment was just making the elves work for them for a while. Knowing there would be even less work if he did that, Belena was taken aback. She warned him that even though they were chivalrous bandits, he must not look down on them as that didn't change the fact that they were criminals wanted in two kingdom. Plady interrupted and said that their farm already was full of criminals, and Vale was a calamity that could destroy the world so they didn't think there would be any problem. The bandits examined their current situation and it seemed like they were in a dead end. Belena suggested Kidan hand them over to the demons, and he wondered what would happen if he did that. She explained that it would depend but the demon king of the generation was a man who dislikes unnecessary killing, so she didn't think they would receive the death penalty. She also mentioned that even though they punished them by themselves, they would still have to be obligated to turn them in. Kidan understood the situation but he didn't want the king to have so much trouble since he was busy with the war against the human race. Plady suggested letting them work there until things settled down for the king and it sounded like a good idea to Kidan. Their punishment was settled and Kidan left the supervision of the elves to Vale and she would get a treat from him in return. The elves were hesitant from Vale and accepted their fate. Kidan then offered them some tea as if they were their guest. They sat down at the table and Kidan wanted to know what each of them was good at before they started to work there. Platy asked them if they were good at farm work like plucking weeds and harvesting crops. The boss told them to not underestimate them and Platy thought it was a good thing, but she said that forest dwellers can't work in the fields. Belina explained that elves don't have any kind of farming culture. By nature, they were a race that gathered fruits or herbs for their sustenance. To elves, nature was just something that existed and not something they could work with to make their lives better. They also find it very difficult to work on the farm. Platy was trying to understand while Vale kept her attitude. When Vale asked why they left their mountain and ate someone else's food, they explained that it was because their home was stolen from them by the humans and the demon. Kidan felt guilty because they were just like bears that left their forests and went to neighboring towns, and they built houses and stripped the elves of their own home to make their lives more luxurious. He bowed and apologized for cutting down a lot of trees from the forest without knowing it was home to the elves. It seemed that their forests gradually withered and died due to humans using large amounts of mana for the war. Now they had been stripped of both their land and food. Lady now understood why they resorted to banditry. Kidan was still feeling guilty for being part of it, but the boss explained that the forests around there were part of his land and forests aren't exclusive to elves alone in the first place. The only thing certain there was that they stole from someone whom they thought was an aristocrat. That was why they would atone for their sin. The boss was sure about her decision as Kidan apologized to them, and he was the first of his kind that they had met. Kidan became so happy and thanked her. Belena didn't think elves were suited to work there so she insisted on sending them back to where they came from. Kidan was having a hard time understanding why she was acting like that. The boss wondered was the container not coated in enamel and he didn't know how to explain. Then something came to his mind and he took them to where he made it. The boss explained that they could make fine enamel from the ash by thoroughly straining it and then dissolving it in water. If he bakes his wares coated in it, it would increase their durability without melting. Kadan didn't know they could make enamel like that, but it was actually the basic knowledge for all elves. Platy asked if this deviated from their mindset towards nature. She explained that they still consider themselves workers who made use of nature to the bare minimum. They were most at home when it came to making tools made from nature's bounty. They could even make leather goods and glassware. Platy got excited hearing her words as she was skilled at compounding potions, but still needed more lab equipment. It was easy for them to help her. Belena started to scream and cry. They got confused and wondered what was wrong with her. She explained that pottery was the new job she had just received. She apologized for not telling them elves were good at making articles, but she just didn't want to be left jobless so she didn't tell them. Platy was confused as she always had a lot of work to do. Belena did cleaning, laundry, and most of the housework. She told her to not underestimate herself as she was doing a thorough job and she was actually a lifesaver. Kadan now understood what was up to her and decided everyone to help her with chores from now on. This wasn't actually what she wanted as that would only decrease her workload. Kadan explained that they would all split the chores and let the elves teach them some skills that they didn't have. That way, she could tackle all sorts of things and among those, she would be able to find something she could pour her heart and soul into. He also apologized for not noticing her worries and thanked her for everything she had done. Belina teared up and thanked him. Platy wondered if there was any chore she could do. Aileron approached Belina and introduced herself. She mentioned that she could teach her pottery if she would like. Belina was confused and hesitant as she was the one who wanted to send them to the Demon King. However, Aileron understood that it was only because she wanted to secure her position. She knew so well how it felt to lose where she belonged so she could relate to her. Eventually, Belina 
Belena accepted her offer and they started right away. Belena tried over and over until she could make something useful, and with that their farm welcomes another group of friends. Meanwhile at the Royal Demon Palace, Zidane needed Kadan's help even though it pains him to do it. In the next scene, elves and Kadan go hunting. It was their first time traveling to a high-level dungeon. One of them wondered what was their target and since Vale had been wanting to eat them, they were going to hunt square boars. She mentioned that they could also use their hide to make leather goods out of it like belts and bags. There was one boar appeared and she made a direct hit to the boar. Lampi praised her archery skills. Kadan wanted to learn how they were so good at it. She explained that the bow was made from a combination of different types of wood, making it sturdy and flexible. With that, they could attack their opponent even from afar. Lampi asked the other elf if she could make a magic arrow with an explosive potion in its arrowhead. Kadan wondered what kind of opponent they were fighting in that powerful way. She apologized and said that it was her gusto as a former Imperial Guard talking. Kadan warned her politely to be moderate in her equipment upgrade. The elf was sure that they wouldn't need any equipment with a dragon living with them. Lampi agreed and mentioned the lifeless king. Kadan didn't think they would achieve true peace as long as the war between humans and demons continued. Since their hunt was over, they headed home. While walking, Kadan wondered how the demon king was doing, and both Lampi and the elf girl were surprised. He mentioned that he lived with them for a while and even helped build a house which was quite enough to make them shock. He mentioned that they held his marriage ceremony with Astris there when the demon king appeared and was fighting with a woman. They didn't even figure out what was going on while they were fighting. Astris was also there and told the elves to listen to what they had to say. Kidan said that it would be best if they temporarily stopped that. She apologized and stated that she was counting on him. He ordered Orkubo and he tied her up easily. Kidan asked if he was okay and the demon king apologized for making a ruckus. Belena and Betami appeared and were so happy to see the Demon King and Astris. They wondered why Lady Glazia, the woman the Demon King was fighting, was there. The Demon Lord said that they had come to discuss something with him. First he introduced her. She was the one of the Heavenly Four, Glacia the Malicious. Plati and Kadan were surprised and she asked if Glacia was the rebel who set up their marriage but she wasn't. The Demon King explained that he was there because he drove out the rebels who attempted to take his place, and thanks to that, he was able to wipe them all out, except for one person. He mentioned that she had the highest position among the group of rebels and was also the most flamboyant in her action. After all, she declared that she would defeat him and become the next ruler. Plady asked if he would execute her now that he had suppressed her. He considers Glacia's boldness as a good thing. The others were just trying to remove him from his position as the Demon King, but Glacia was different. Such an outstanding person was too good to be disposed of. But she was resolute in her decision and no matter how many times he urged her to return to allegiance or knocked her down, she would not comply. At that point he might have to resort to executing her. He really hated killing his own people. Plady said that it was not related to the human race but it was hard for them to interfere in such internal affairs. The Demon King tried to say something but couldn't so Astris helped him to explain the situation. She stated that Glasta was in love with Lord Zaydan. They were all confused so Zidane explained that Glacia never aimed for the throne. She did want to succeed in his place if Astris was more important than his title as Demon King. But when they returned to the castle with Astris as the Demon Queen, the situation completely changed. She wanted him to make herself queen too, and if he can't do that she wanted to be executed. Hence, he may succeeded in eradicating disturbing elements and discord within the kingdom, but his problem with Glazia still remained. Lampi suggested making her the Demon King's concubine, but he couldn't do that as she should only have one wife. Making Astris his one and only wife was what he pledged before Hades on their wedding day. Therefore, the moment he makes Glacia his second wife, divine punishment may fall upon her. Glacia stated that she wanted to be executed but he wouldn't do that either. He apologized for making a rash decision as someone with responsibility regarding Astris's case. In addition, he didn't realize that she was in love with him. Kadan asked if Glacia considered being a concubine as an alternative. As someone who deserves to be executed for committing muting she didn't think she was worth it. He then thought this may be a problem for Astris but she was okay with it. She was the king's wife and she understood that it was inevitable that he would have a concubine. She didn't get along well with Glacia but her military prowess was top-notch, and the Demon Kingdom could not afford to lose her. Glacia discreetly threw a word at her and they started to fight. The Demon Lord was apologizing again while Kadan was thinking about what they should do about it. The Lifeless King came and asked if there was something wrong. Elves and the others were confused as to why the Lifeless King was there. Vale also came to see what the fuss was all about. Glacia ripped off the ropes guarded the Demon King, and told him and Astris to leave while she took care of the Lifeless King. Seeing her protecting the Demon King surprised everyone. The King approached her and stated that the Demon Kingdom needed someone like her. She couldn't understand how he could act composed at a time like that, 
So Belina and Betami explained that the lifeless king was a neighbor of them, and there was nothing to worry about. While she was trying to understand the situation, the lifeless king wanted to ask a few questions. After talking for a while, the lifeless king said that because of how powerful the vows made in front of the god, the demon king couldn't accept a concubine. After all, Hades had Demeter Cephany the mother earth goddess as his only wife. Thus, he was a god who didn't approve of adultery. Kidan didn't know gods had devoted wives. The fact that he refers to himself as the Mother Earth Goddess Husband and not as the God of the Underworld says a lot. The Earth, the Seas, and the Sky. Each God had their own way of asserting control over their respective realm. But for Hades, his relationship with his beloved wife, who was also Mother Earth, was important. This may be the reason why cheating on her was out of the question. Therefore, he compelled those who received his blessings to love only one wife just like he did. That sounded pretty understandable to Kidan. The lifeless king said that the demon king was the ruler of the demon kingdom which fights the human race. So this is why he must unite small groups each with their own way of thinking and lead them as one large group. Sometimes he just has to marry multiple women who have special connections to accomplish that. The Demon King stated that he thought he was fully aware of his responsibilities as a king, but it seemed that he let his feelings for Astra's get the better of him and made a careless decision. Not to mention he was completely oblivious to Glacia's adoration for him. Glacia was still insisting on getting executed while he was refusing her. Kidan asked what they should do about that. The lifeless king said that there was only one thing they should do, and summoned Hades again. After hearing the situation, Hades said that the more he hark, the more blasphemous it sounded. It hadn't even been a year since they got married, but they were already violating his own terms. Kidan got scared as Hades was really angry. Glacia begged Hades to listen and explained that this whole situation was caused by her own selfishness and Lord Zidane rejected her feeling. If it was divine punishment, she must be the one who received it. She also wants Hades to take her with him if she can't marry Zidane. Astris interrupted and stated that Glacia was an asset to demons in the war between humans and demons, which was why that concubinage was a matter of life and death for their demon race. Hades was stuttering and sweating. Suddenly a woman came. The lifeless king summoned Hades' wife. Hades' wife stated that even though she appreciates how her husband loves her, his earnestness and inflexibility were some of his flaws. She wondered if Hades was trying to exert dominance because of Zeus and Poseidon. They were fighting like a newly married couple while Kidan was thinking how cute they were. The mother of Earth Goddess understood thy thoughts, but she was also Hades' wife, and she could not ignore his wishes. She didn't want to set a lacking valor of example to the rest of the three either. A god's blessing was a kind of promise between a mortal and a god. If it were easily broken, any contract's value would be worthless. In order to break a contract whilst preserving its value required a special and equal measure. Suddenly it seemed like there was something wrong. The mother of Earth pointed at Kidan and asked if he was one of Zeus's children. She sensed that he was someone from beyond their realm. She also guessed that he received something special from Hephaestus. This made her happy. She smiled and said that if things worked out, she might be able to grant an exception. The gift Kadan received from Hephaestus was the special thing to allow the demon king to have concubine. She said that the holy swords made by her husband Hades have the ownership of the seven holy swords. Lord Zidane took out his holy sword and Kadan's sword was also made by God. She approved them. Hades was surprised that he already had the other two. He explained that since that man's sword was a phantom, no one knew its whereabouts until they recently confirmed it. He asked Astris if she brought them with her and she said she did. However, when she showed the sword it was broken. Glacia said that it was the proof of loyalty to the demon king and they would never let it go. Plady and Kidan seemed confused and Plady told the Lord to explain. He said that a hundred years ago they owned five of the seven holy swords made by the god of the underworld, each belonging to each of the five families of the demon race. Then a war broke out between those families for the Demon King's throne, and the winner who lasted until the end was Zidane's ancestor. After that, his ancestor gathered all the holy swords from the four defeated families and destroyed them with his own hands. That was the origin of the four heavenly kings. Kidan now seemed to understand why they kept the broken swords. If they hadn't made that many swords, it would have prevented the fight from happening in the first place, Kidan thought. The Mother of Earth mentioned that there was a reason for that, and it was something that deeply involved Kidan. A long time ago, when the gods decided to rule that world, Zeus ruled the heavens, Poseidon the oceans, and her husband Hades ruled the earth. And then they decided to spread their descendants in their territories. But Zeus became greedy. He wasn't satisfied with only ruling heaven, so he sent his descendants to Hades' territory to take it for himself. That was what that world called humans. Humans were invaders sent from heaven. The war between his descendants, the demons and humans made by Zeus was something that still continues even after a long time. So Hades helped them by making the holy swords and brought them into that world. Kidon wondered why he made seven swords and if it was really necessary to make the demons fight each other. He explained that it was because a holy sword could be made into a true holy sword. 
Zidane mentioned that the Holy Swords had their own souls. Kidan loved his sword and wouldn't let it go. That was important too, but Zidane explained that Holy Swords get stronger by learning from fighting. In other words, the seven Holy Swords were destroying each other, absorbing the memory of its opponent's soul, and the last standing sword would be the strongest one. That was the true Holy Sword. Plady figured that the true Holy Sword had not yet been made. Kidan thought maybe his sword had to be destroyed by the Demon King too, but he refused to do it as he couldn't fight with him. Kidan got upset because that would mean the true Holy Sword couldn't be made. Plady got mad at Hades for doing such a roundabout thing. Hades said that even with his power, the maker of Zeus's descendants, the god of arts Hephaestus, was unmatchable. Hephaestus was the one who gave Kidan his gift. Hades had something to ask Kidan, with the power of, would it be possible to fix those broken holy swords? They were all taken aback for a moment. She explained that if it was his power, she believed it was possible to fix the broken holy swords and boost them up to sacred holy swords. From original swords, six of them would be destroyed to complete it. But if there were two true holy swords, it was more than enough to destroy the human. Plady couldn't believe she was being serious. She said that it was actually how it should be. If her husband could drive Zeus's force out of his ruled territory, it would be a great achievement. Lord Zidane couldn't believe Kidan really had that much power inside himself. Aileron and the other elves were also shocked but were happy that their lives would be much easier. Hades' precious wife also mentioned that those who bring the earth back to her husband's rule, which was impossible after thousands of years, surely would be rewarded. Hades approved her and said that if the demon king Zaydan managed to get that glorious achievement, he would allow a special condition and amend his contract with him. He then asked Kidan if he would do it. Kidan seemed unsure, as he would be the one who made a sword to destroy human. As Hades thought, even if he was someone from a different world, he still had doubts about humans so he wanted to tell him something good. Even though his ruling was the best among gods, he heard he was estranged from his father, Zeus, because of his ugly appearance. Using that gift given by Hephaestus to shatter Zeus's ambitions would be exhilarating. Kidan got mad as Hephaestus wasn't that kind of god. Hades asked if he was on the human side. Kidan said that it wasn't like that and Hephaestus was a god who genuinely only likes to make things, and he didn't give him that gift to be used that way. His thoughtful gift was not to be used for that kind of thing. However, if he could control the situation by making the holy swords, he accepted to fix them. Zidane noticed that Kidan was still hesitant about using the power he had gained from Hephaestus for a particular purpose, as he was apprehensive about its consequences. In response, Zidane reassured him that a true holy sword, crafted by the hands of a saint, would never be wielded as a weapon against humanity and that he would not allow it to happen. The girls wondered what was his plans, and he explained that they could break the sacred barrier around the human castle made by Zeus with the true holy sword. That would be great as the demons couldn't enter and were repelled, and in the current stalemate they could take them by surprise. Lord Zedon swore to destroy the human political system. It was the royal family who worshipped Zeus and maintained they were the superior species. If Kidan takes them down, he could dismantle the humans as a nation. All that would remain would be humans who were no different than the demons. Hades said that there were those who thought the sons of Zeus always had a plan, but his wife didn't agree because if only the kings of the human race, even Zeus couldn't interfere. It was all Zidane's decision so she asked if it was preferable. The mother goddess gave Glacia her blessing and if she had that blessing, she would be recognized by Hades and would be able to marry. Zidane thanked her for her kindness. Hades didn't want her to be too generous but it was okay. His holy sword was supposed to swing once and after two strikes the flowers would bloom. Hades then offered a small token of his appreciation to Kidan. It was a blessing for his crops to do a little better. After he gave the blessing, they disappeared. Kidan wondered if it was resolved now. He then made his decision and told everyone to join their forces together and prepare for the demon lord's departure. After a while, he managed to put together the two broken swords. Kidan asked about Zidane's strategy meeting. He said that he got some information from the elves and they would be able to get into the castle from the mountain. Thanks to that, he was sure they would be able to minimize the number of human casualties. Zidane and Astris were grateful for Kidan's help. Astris stated that she would give him a report when the battle was won. Kidan didn't want her to be so stiff and told her to come visit them whenever she wanted. Betami and Belena gave Astris and Glazia the cloth with counter magic they made to protect them from enemy attacks. Then they teared up because they would be missing them. Glacia promised that she would definitely protect the demon kind as well as herself, but Astris didn't think they would be needing her protection. The food was ready, and Glacia was confused by the look and the name of the food. The tonkatsu was a must-have dish for everyone to try. Glacia took a bite and the moment she tasted the food, 
she couldn't stop herself from eating like an animal. While eating, Platy and Kadan hoped that everything would work out successfully. A few days passed and the human king was angry as his workers hadn't been able to find St. Kadan. While he was complaining about how incompetent they were, one of his men came to give him some bad news. Apparently, there was urgent news from the broader that the demon king led a large army to invade their country. The invasion was underway. Not only the king, but his soldiers were also shocked because they didn't do anything to provoke them. The king ordered them to send their armies, but the generals leading the army returned to their territories with their troops because the king ordered them to search for Kidan and told them to disband. He told them to hurry up and contact the armies to buy some time. He was sure that they would never defeat their final trump card, the Sacred Barrier. Meanwhile, Astris and Glacia breached the Sacred Barrier while the Demon King was distracting people. The barrier was breached and the news came to the king. The kind didn't want to believe it because the barrier was Zeus's blessing. He ordered them to go notify the church and quickly deploy a new barrier, but it was impossible because it was great magic from a thousand years ago. Disregarding maintenance, they had forgotten how to deploy it. The king was angry because the church couldn't even manage to keep track of the skills they received from God. Suddenly, Zidane appeared in the king's room to stop that conflict. He asked him to come with them while the king was trembling and sweating in fear. After they invaded the palace, the kingdom of humans was dismantled, and the demon king promised the safety of everyone but the royal family and church officials who ruled the kingdom. This also applies to people from other worlds. The demon king was leading the world to peace, but not everyone was happy about the fact that righteousness was being defeated by the demon. In the following days, Kidan prayed to Hephaestus and stated his gratitude for being able to live in peace. Kadan was thinking about his journey in that world and how he gained so many things that he can be grateful for. Thanks to the mermaids, seasonings and luxury items can be made and crafts have improved with the help of the elves. He even made a western-style toilet that seemed popular with everyone, and he was excited to show it to the demon king. He wondered if the strategy went well. He then went to feed the wolves with rice while Vale was watching him feeding them with the rice that she wanted to eat. She mentioned that recently her mountain dungeon had been acting strange. Trees and fruit that she had never seen before were growing. Kadan was both surprised and happy because the environment in her dungeon was different depending on the stage and they could use it to grow various crops efficiently. He had been thinking were using crops to experiment with. He decided to name it Vale Mountain Dungeon Orchard. Conversion Plan when they arrived at the dungeon, it was full of fruit that was edible. Viel wondered if their taste was good and he approved her. He also mentioned that when the fruits were available, the menu would grow. He suggested preserving the ones that were grown so that everyone could eat them together. They have to have an equal amount for everyone. However, the veil had already started to eat. Kidan told them to stop as he would get in trouble if he didn't know the yield. She couldn't promise him because she was smart and different from the dogs around her. Later, according to the reports from Pochi and his friends, Vale was found in agony after eating astringent persimmon. Astringent persimmon were bitter and couldn't be eaten unless properly prepared. Thanks to Vale, more dishes could be made so he was still grateful for her. He wanted to share it with everyone as soon as possible and he couldn't even wait to see the Demon King. While he was thinking, the Demon King Zaydan came and it seemed like something was wrong. Kadan asked what was it and wondered how things went in the Human Kingdom. He then noticed the little girl behind him. The girl asked Kadan if he was the owner of that farm. When he approved her, she introduced herself as Princess Redislet, the only daughter of the king of the highest race in the world, the humans. Starting today, she informed him that she would give him the honor of taking care of her. Redislet seemed pretty determined about the things she just said. Platy told everyone to gather to talk about the situation. They asked Lord Zidane what was that all about and if the plan failed. He explained that human politics after the king died had ruined the country and thanks to Kadan it was no longer a problem. Kadan wondered who that kid was. Redislet got mad at them for whispering in her presence and told them to bow down to her. She stated that they should be proud for generations to come. While she was bragging about how she was the number one princess of the human country and how there was no other being like her, Platy slapped her in the face and shut her up. Redislet got humbled after Platy hit her. Platy told her to listen with her ears closely and she obeyed her. She stated that the human kingdom had been destroyed and royalty without a kingdom was just a person which means she was nothing but a single person. Redislet was too stunned to speak. Platy then asked Zidane if he wanted to keep her there and he approved her. Kadan seemed confused, so Zidane explained that she had nowhere to return to. Even though the king was killed, the kingdom had yet to be conquered. Since her new subjects were a different species, he thought it would take a lot of work. The old regime of the kingdom was still there and the embers of a dying dynasty would continue to smoke for quite some time. And in the middle of it, knowledge of the princess's whereabouts was hazardous. Platy said that anyone could be king if they kidnapped and married the princess, and Kida now understood the situation better. Platy started to yell at Redislet that the only place for her now was there or in the underworld, so if she kept talking like that she would get nothing. After being slapped by Platy and yelled at, Redislet broke down in tears and begged to be killed. 
Realizing she was no longer a princess, Platy scolded her for her naivety once again. Kidan kindly asked Platy to be nicer to her but she blamed him for being too nice to her. Platy asked what Zidane was thinking by prioritizing Redislet's life over the safety of demons. He explained that it was a pretty embarrassing thing but he had made a promise to the king of human country. In his last breath, he wanted Zidane to spare the lives of his people including his family. He wanted to respect the wish that he showed to him. Hearing his reason, Platy asked about Kidan's opinions. He was fine with taking care of her. Zidane stated that he was truly sorry but as he said it was fine for Kidan. Kidan then approached the princess and welcomed her. She held his hand and stated that she would be in his care. Platy was there slapping the paper she was holding, and the princess was startled when she did that. Platy said that she would be working there as much as she ate so she should prepare herself. She then changed her clothes to the normal outfit and they went to the field to teach her some work. Kidan knew that she probably hadn't lifted anything before so they would be teaching her to do simple tasks, such as weeding the fields and checking the health of the crops. He then introduced Gobukichi and said that she would be guided by him, but she was terrified when she saw him. Platy came unexpectedly and hit her again telling her to stop with her attitude as the goblins were their friends there. She stated that monsters were not their only friends there since there was a former princess, there was also a former thief, a prisoner, a dragon, and even an undead king who often comes into play. She warned her and told her to realize how insignificant she was in the world. She accepted her fate and started to weed the field. Kidan wanted to say that it must be hard for her as her situation was the same as his, but Platy said that her strong pride needs to be physically shattered, or else she can't move a finger in there. Kidan understood what she was trying to do so he didn't interrupt her and told Redislet to do her best. After a while Redislet was not happy about her situation but she knew she had to do her best to survive there. Kidan came and told her to wash her hands and take a break for a while. She looked at the bread he brought and when she tasted it, she couldn't believe it because it was better than anything she had at the royal palace. While eating she didn't realize that she said it seemed there was something to be learned from commoners. When she realized what she just said, she immediately guarded herself because she thought she would get hit by him. However, he said that he was glad she was trying to get used to it like that. He had the responsibility to fulfill Mao's request too. Redislet wondered what this place and the building were, and if it was some kind of penal colony. He thought about it for a second and said that it was better to not know for her own safety. She didn't insist on anything and said that she wouldn't ask any more than that. Also, she was not thinking about running away from there. If he said work, she would work and that was her position. Kidan seemed glad and stated that she was unexpectedly diligent. She was being kidnapped from her country and her freedom was gone so it wouldn't be surprising if she chose to die in desperation but she was alive and she still had hope. Hope to take back everything she had lost. Kidan wondered if there was really such a great thing and she said that the hope inside her heart was Kidan the saint. He was shocked and couldn't say anything while she was telling him about the famous saint Kidan who her father was always looking for him. If the Kidan the saint knows of the danger that befalls humanity, he would come to rescue her and destroy the demons as she said. Her wrong thoughts weren't looking good. He wanted to hurry up go back and warn everyone about it. Bedemi came and informed him that she was asked by Platy to make the newcomer clothes, and she wondered if he knew where she was. Since she called him saint, Kidan was panicked that Redislet would find out who he was but she thought his name was Saint. He was relieved that she was an airhead. In the next scene, Redislet is crying and cursing at something. She was actually praying to Zeus and Saint Kidan to save humanity when Hades appeared. Once again Zidane apologized for bothering Kidan and stated that he wondered if he should report directly to Hades. Kidan didn't mind but he wondered if it was okay to call God so often. The lifeless king said that this time, God was the one who wanted to be called. Hades thanked the immortal king for summoning him in response to the oracle. He said that it seemed like the demon king Zidane finally destroyed Zeus and all of his kin. To be precise, he said that it was not the humans that were destroyed, but the human nation. He would like to rule the earth together with the humans without shedding any more unnecessary blood. Hades said that in any case, he was the first demon king who had full control over the earth. From this day forward, he would allow him to call himself the greatest demon king of all time. The demon king Zidane teared up as it was a great honor for him. Suddenly, Kadan noticed that Gike, Platy's brother, was there standing. He said that he heard the rumor from his sister so he came. Hades saw the prince and asked him if he was the prince of the mermaid country. It was his first time standing in front of a god so he was nervous. He had heard from his father that the demon had ended the conflict on land and he was also hoping to meet and celebrate with the future demon king. The demon lord was not much older than him and yet he was already the demon king. Not only that, but he also had already ended the war with the human kingdom. He stated that even if he followed in his footsteps, he could not compare to his talent and ambition. Zidane didn't agree as Prince Arowana had a good personality and good traits as a ruler. 
As the head of a neighboring kingdom, he could think of nothing more reassuring than to have him ruling over their mermaid kingdom. Hades congratulated everyone and announced that this was a celebration for everyone. Kidan then stated that he would prepare an offering of God and bring food to the demon king, Princes Arowana, and the lifeless king. Arowana was watching them wondering what was going on and after a while the food was ready. Kidan thought it would be nice to have something spring-like as if heaven and earth were budding so he made bamboo shoot rice and offered it to the god. He told Hades to eat it with two sticks. Hades took a bite of the bamboo rice and stated that from now on, rice cooked with bamboo shoots would be designed as the food of God because it tasted too good. Kadan was surprised when Vale came. She literally scolded the god of Earth, Hades, for eating her crops for himself. Hades said that he had declared bamboo shoot rice as God's food, and in order to praise it, all things on Earth shall share the happiness of eating rice cooked with bamboo shoots with God. He didn't forget to thank the Earth for nurturing the bamboo shoots and the rice, Kidan was happy that he ended up receiving such high praise. Vale wanted to have a beer with the food as they were having a dinner party. Gike and Zidane were confused, so he explained that it was an alcoholic drink he made recently in the house. It sounded like an interesting drink, so Hades wanted to try it too. In that case, he had some Japanese sake he called it even though it was different from the worlds he had lived. Hades downed the beer but was too fragile to handle the alcohol yet. He decreed beer as the drink of God. The lifeless king wanted to mention that Kadan's physical strength and magical power would be fully restored if he ate something that was praised by God. It seemed that those certified as God's drink had detoxification and other effects. Hades wanted to share with Demeter as well and he counted on the lifeless king to call her. The lifeless king spelled some words to summon Demetra, but he accidentally summoned her, Poseidon, and his wife too. Hades was confused as to why they were there. Poseidon's wife was so excited to meet with Kadan as she had heard stories about him. Even among the gods he was reputed to be the bearer of knowledge not found anywhere else in the world. Kadan was honored. Kadan turned to Plati and stated that he was going to serve dinner to the gods and that he needed her help. And after a while, the feast of the gods began and everyone was enjoying their food and beer. The gods were satisfied with Kidan's food. The princes were watching them secretly and wondered what they were doing. She then noticed something and interrupted everyone, asking why Zeus wasn't there as even the god of the earth and the god of the sea were there. She told Hades to tell Zeus the plight that human rave was in now and she was sure he would bring some salvation. The gods giggled as they weren't taking her seriously. The gods explained that Zeus was selfish and thought he was special. If Zeus finds out about that land he might say he would make it his own sanctuary and make it his own private sanctuary. The princess was now sure that they couldn't call him. She didn't know and thought that Tenjin Zeus was a great god that everyone respected and she thought he was a great god. She got more furious and left there crying while calling for Saint Kidan. Kidan told everyone to leave her alone for now. The gods were still confused as to why the human kingdom's princess was there. They worried that it would be a problem because they talked about Zeus's secret without thinking. Plady said that it should be fine if it was her. She stated that she needs to learn more about the outside world. Until now, her world was only inside the castle. She was going to face a lot of trouble in the future since she was a high-handed lady. Kidan said that she was trying her best there but it was because of her hope for Kidan the saint. Kidan knew that he had to do something about that in order to make Retzelet become a person who chooses her own life. Plady and Zidane were impressed and Gike wanted to help him. The gods were pleased by Kidan's intentions. They also had to be careful to not irritate Zeus. Therefore, Hades told everyone that they couldn't let Zeus know about the existence of that paradise because it would be a mess if he found out. If he discovers it, Hades promises to fight back with all their might. Knowing the gods were protecting them made Kidan feel encouraged. They continued eating and Hades was satisfied. Not only Hades but the other gods were so happy and drunk. They decided to reward everyone themselves because there was no way they would leave after such a feast. Hades blessed the land with a year of good harvest, Poseidon blessed with a year of bountiful catch, and their wives blessed everyone's livelihood. After they were blessed, they disappeared, and Platy said that the recipe for magic potion she didn't know before suddenly flowed inside her head. It wasn't just Platy, everyone felt a lot better than before. Kadan figured that everyone's ability had improved after the blessing. If everyone was blessed with happiness, Kadan was happy too. He wanted Reda Slet to be happy too, but Platy said that even though hoping for happiness was okay, that type of person must not be pampered. Having delicious food was good enough for Vale. Platy then realized that their meal was not there yet. Vale wanted to eat too, but Platy said that she had already eaten so much before. She was pretty mad because of how lazy Vale was. Kidan was watching them fight and he said that to eat was the way to live. Meanwhile, Reda Slet was sitting by herself thinking about the things the gods said about Zeus. Until now, she had been saying bad things to others and even though she believed in Zeus and justice, she was still in disbelief. She was still thinking about Saint Kadan to save herself. 
Kadan came and asked if she would like to try having her own field. He took her to the field that he gave and told her to plant anything she would like. The produce on the farm was everyone's, but everything that grew in the area he gave her was hers so she could eat everything she grew. In Kidan's head, the best thing she could do to nurture her mind was food education. If she starts feeling love and gratefulness, this should be good for her mind and body. Redislet wanted to plant some broad beans since she liked it so much. Kadan said that she could ask what she doesn't know and after that she has to be responsible and manage it. She seemed pretty determined and stated that this was wonderful. She wanted to rebuild the human country territory there and would operate under the direct control of the princess, which wasn't exactly what Kadan had in mind, but he just let her do her thing. In the next scene, Kadan was working while Gobukichi came. He said that there was something he was wondering about. The field work was progressing well and it sounded like it was a good thing for Kidan. However, he said that it was progressing really well which makes it strange. One day they were out in the field doing odd jobs in the morning. That day they were going to weed the field and the weeds were growing fast on the part that was fertilized with hyperfish fertilizer. Weed extermination and detailed management were no longer a struggle. But just before they began to work, they noticed that beside the crops, the field had been cleaned and there were piles of weeds piled up beside the field so he got scared. Kidan said that it must be someone else's doing but Gobukichi said that he asked everyone but no one knew about it. Kidan went to ask Redislet but she said that she was focusing on her field and didn't work there, which meant that there was someone other than the farmer there who had cut the weed. It seemed so mystical. Kidan wanted to think positively and said it would be a good-natured thief that pulls out weeds while stealing, but there was no trace of goods being stolen. Not only that, the sick leaves had been thinned out and the pests had been exterminated. Kidan was thankful but it was still strange. As the owner of the farm, he has to unravel that mystery by ambushing it at night. It looked like the crime was committed at night and since Gobukichi was there, he didn't want Redislet to be there but she refused him because she was a field owner too, and she couldn't let it pass when someone suspicious was lurking there. Kidan noticed something and told everyone to be quiet. From the ground something was surfacing. A bunch of heads were surfacing and Kidan thought they were zombies. Redislet was freaking out because there were so many of them. She told Kidan to do something but Gobukichi wanted to wait for a while. He fired up the light and they saw a bunch of cute fairies smiling at them. The little girls introduced themselves as the spirits of the earth, and they were familiars of the god of the underworld, Hades. They were spiritual beings directly related to nature whose task was to maintain the health of nature. Gobukichi mentioned that spirits blend in with mana and couldn't be seen or touched but they were different. They said that thanks to the blessing of the Hades they can materialize themselves. After they took the power given by God of the Underworld and Mother Earth, they got powered up. They thanked him for opening up that empty land. They were very happy which was why they wanted to thank him. Now that they have materialized themselves, they could help him. Kidan now understood everything but wondered why they were doing it so late at night. They explained that it was in order to not get caught by anyone which was common sense for spirits. They said that there was no helping it because they got caught. From now on, they would openly help him anytime and wanted him to give them a task. Redislet told the spirits to come and serve her but Platy came out of nowhere and hit her again. Platy thought they were doing something strange whispering like that. She asked what Kidan planned to do. Gobukichi said that odd jobs were their responsibility so he hoped that Kidan could give them another job. The spirits were begging for some job. While Kidan and Platy were thinking about what job they should be doing, Redislet was not happy because she wanted them to serve her. Platy asked if Kidan had any place he needed help with. There was one but he hesitated to ask spirits to do it. The spirits told him to not shine and they were ready for any kind of job. Since they said that it was okay, he took them to his house and said that they would work as housekeepers starting today. Belena was not happy about it since her job would decrease again. He said that there was a facility that he wanted to build and he thought he had to decrease her workload first. In the end, he wanted her to take care of those children. Belena was thrilled by the cuteness of the spirits and was happy to do it. Betami asked if she could make clothes for those children like maid clothes. Kidan thought it would be nice if they had work clothes instead of maid clothes. Now that everything settled, everyone was getting a new job which was a good thing. Kidan was happy that they could continue the next plan which was to make the thing he really wanted to make, the bathhouse. Laddie wondered what a bathhouse was. He explained that it was a place to wash your life which scared her a little. He explained that it meant that everyone who was tired from working would be refreshed as if coming back to life. That sounded amazing for Platy who had a lot to do in her daily job. Kidan was happy that thanks to everyone they could now build one. Reda Slet was watching Kidan thinking about her life in the palace. Kidan told her to wait for it. This kind of life was full of surprise to her but he believed it would bring a smile to her face. She was impressed by his words and hoped that she could start a new chapter of her life with cute friends. Later on, the god of the wisdom of heaven Hermes was in Zeus's presence and he wanted to inform him about something that Zeus would know sooner or later. Zeus seemed pretty bored even though he said he was swamped. 
He wanted Hermes to give him a piece of very important news or else he would punish him. Hermes said the human country had been defeated but he didn't seem to understand him as it was impossible for that to happen. Zeus was shocked. Hermes added that the land was part of Hades' territory and his creation. The humans were the invaders. The demons who won didn't kill all the humans. Instead, they were annexed by the demons Zeus was enraged not by Hades, but by human. They should have fought until the end even if they knew they were going to lose. Hermes asked if they should send them help but he refused. He found it weird and abrupt and wondered if Hades deceived them and helped the demon. Hermes didn't think he would do something like that as he wasn't like Zeus, but he was sure Hades cheated. Hermes got sick of his attitude and started to yell at him. He said that if he was going to wage a war between gods because of a baseless accusation then all the gods including himself would side against him because he had no popularity at all. No one would want to fight a life-threatening battle for him. Zeus got mad as his son was being cruel and threatened him to throw a tantrum but Hermes didn't care at all. Hermes was still wondering why humans lost to the demons, and there was one thing he could think. It was probably because of the visitor from another world. The man who was called the saint was the one who had the gift from his brother Hephaestus. That power showed its influence and stopped that fight. If Zeus finds out about that, things would go bad so the existence of the saint should be kept as secret. All they wanted was things to stay calm. Naturally, it was God's job to protect the peace of the respectable saint and god of craft Hephaestus. However, he was concerned that Zeus would keep behaving like that. Zeus was so egoist that he thought he was the one who controlled everything, and he was the strongest being. Every virtue was his possession, and there was nothing in that world that could go against his will. But he was still annoyed that humans lost their territory. He decided that if he couldn't rule over the land, it would be better to destroy it. Meanwhile, in the Kadan's land, Redislet was scolding him for being too slow. She wanted him to teach her how to raise Sorameme. Kadan brought the Sorameme seedlings and explained that they would slowly get bigger and turn into delicious Sorameme. However, it still depends on Redislet's effort. She was determined to raise them with her best. Kadan mentioned that there were many tricks to raise them so it could be a little difficult. He suggested she imagine the taste of the Sorameme that they raised and do their best to eat them again. By compromising her character, she thanked him. Kadan was surprised but didn't make it weird. They started with making the ridges. When he was about to show her how to do it, an earthquake started. He held red a sled and waited for it to end. There had never been an earthquake before so he thought it was not that kind of terrain. The earthquake ended but appeared a hole in red a sled's field. Kidan was trying to understand what was happening and wondered if it was a mole-type monster. Just in case, he told Redislet to stand back as there could be a monster there. She was terrified of the monsters and questioned how he wasn't scared too. Kidan told her that it was okay and promised to protect her no matter what. Suddenly something came out from the hole and it was definitely not a mole monster. Redislet was confused and asked if it was a mole but he guessed that it was more like a human. But she was flying with her wings so he thought it could be a dragon. She started to say some stuff about the things Kidan most definitely didn't understand. After mumbling lots of things she stopped Icarus's wings function and fell down on the floor. Her eyes were closed so Redislet thought she was dead but they weren't sure. Her breathing was thin and her body temperature was very low. Orkbo came and took her to the house. Gara Rufa took a look at her and said that the symptoms she was having didn't match her knowledge. In the first place, they didn't even know her race. But she wasn't a human, demon, or a mermaid. From there, they could see characteristics that do not match any of the subspecies derived from it. Platy said if they don't know her species, it would be hard to help her. Gara Rufa stated that they should give her lots of nutrition to cover her body strength, as she couldn't think of anything else to do for now. Gobukichi brought a bowl of natto, as there was nothing else as nutritious and effective for sickness. It wasn't easy to eat but they can't be picky, so he told Gobukichi to open her mouth and he would pour in the natto. They opened her mouth and she started to chew it. With that, they hoped that she would get better. She opened her eyes and stood up but she seemed odd. She started her self-diagnosis and confirmed full functional recovery. She was mumbling about mana self-pair in combat mode while they were looking at her confused. She then kneeled in front of Kidan and recognized him as the one who recovered her from malfunction. She said that she was a blade made by heaven's will. Angel Holka's phone. Due to information loss from now on, Kadan was registered as her new master. Kadan was shocked that an angel was considering him as her master while she was waiting for any kind of order from him. She became her master's blade and was ready to kill all of his enemies. They were all so confused and Kadan told her to stop saying things like that. He asked if she could answer his questions and she approved him. He asked what she was and what race she belonged to. She couldn't answer that question as a lot of information was missing from her memory space. The information Kadan sought was also gone. She said that it was because of her aging. Then a lifeless king came and Kadan thought he might know something. He asked if he knew anything about that angel. Unfortunately, the lifeless king said that even though he lived for a thousand years, he didn't know about the existence of angels. Platy screamed hopelessly that they couldn't do anything about it as even their last hope didn't know about it. 
However, there was still another way left and the lifeless king summoned Hades again. Hades thought Kadan made another delicious food for him but he said he just had a question, which made him a little mad. He asked if he knew something about that angel there. When Hades saw the angel he screamed like he saw a monster. He was freaking out because they actually destroyed them all before. He said that Kadan did well for informing him. He even said that the world was almost in danger of being destroyed and he had just saved the world. That thing called Angel was the vanguard sent by Zeus to seize control of the earth. They were also called the destroyers of the world. Zeus created angels with great care, making them more powerful than any other creatures in the world. With their abilities they caused widespread destruction, turning the world into a sea of flames, splitting the earth and evaporating the sea. Sadly they showed no mercy and all living things were ruthlessly annihilated. Zeus's actions seemed pretty stupid to Platy and Kadan. Redislet wanted to know what happened after that. Hades explained that in a situation that could destroy the world, they, as gods, worked together with the first dragon to annihilate the angels, and it was truly terrible. After that, Poseidon and Hades climbed the heavens, and they scolded Zeus with all their might. But Zeus who didn't want to give up on Earth began to rule it through the human race. Even though she worshipped Zeus, Radislet was annoyed by his actions. The timing between the human race defeat against the demon race with the appearance of an angel who avoided annihilation 4,000 years ago somehow felt like it was planned. Hades commented that he did well finding the angel. Even if he said it like that, it was her being jumped out from his field all of a sudden. Redislet asked what would happen to the angel now. He explained that an angel cannot be left unrestrained because even one of them had the power to destroy the world. It was Hades' responsibility to destroy that angel as the god of that land to protect its existence. Kadan didn't seem to be happy about her existence being erased. He asked if there was any other way aside from destroying her because she looked like a good person. Hades found him kind but she was a weapon without any will or emotions. He tried to explain why he didn't want her to be destroyed but she interrupted him. She said that she remembered herself clearly as a destroyer. She knew she was a weapon and it was true that her existence was a threat to that world. It would be a safe judgment to erase her for the world's safety. She asked him to give her an order and if it was him, she would destroy himself without bothering a single person. Redislet came and hugged her. She said that even though she was a bad person a long time ago, she was different now, and any race could fix their way of living. This was the place where he could forgive that kind of stuff. Plady wondered if she saw herself there as she was once asked to die for that world. Kadan thought about it for a moment and decided that he wanted to cherish her feeling. He asked Hades if he could entrust the angel to him. Hades was surprised and he was about to refuse him, but when Kadan said he would offer a new cuisine, he approved it. He would be at ease if it was none other than Saint Kadan who would take care of her. Kadan accepted the responsibility of taking care of her. Now that the problem is solved, Hades calls Hermes and asks if he is with Zeus. He then asked him to stay there for a minute and he would go to Poseidon and Pokali too. He excused himself and stated that he would be waiting for his new cuisine. The angel asked what would happen from now on. He stated that she would live there with the others. Redislet was so happy to be with the angel. Kidan apologized for deciding that alone but Plady was satisfied as Princess changed since the angel came there. Redislet considered the angel as her little sister and introduced herself. She wanted her to be comfortable with her and ask whatever she wanted to know as she lived there longer than her. The way she acted like an old senior made Platy annoyed but she didn't say anything. The angel surprisingly told Redislet to be quiet and turned to Kadan. She wanted to confirm if the elixir that woke her up from being just a scrap. Kadan didn't seem to understand her question and Gobukichi showed him the natto that he brought. The angel explained that if she didn't get supplied with natto, she would unmistakably stop working. She used her holskaphone's eye and examined the natto's benefits. While she was mumbling about the benefits of it, Kadan thought it could be because of his supreme bearer ability. When she finished listing the things Nato gave her, she wanted Kadan to entrust her with the important role of protecting Nato. Kadan stated that she was actually exaggerating the Nato and it was pretty easy to make, but she was dead serious about not making fun of Nato. He then offered her to try making some and she was in awe. She couldn't believe a slaughter weapon like her could make a life-saving elixir. Kidan was questioning her emotions and Platy find it as an opportunity to nurture her emotions by making Nato. Redislet interrupted and said that she had something that Horu, the angel, needed to do first, which was repairing her field. Firstly, she wanted Horu to check if there was anything in the ground. Horu made a geological scan and there seemed to be a water vein in the ground. Kidan was so happy that they could make the well with the underground water. If there was a well near Redislet's field, then fieldwork would be even easier. She agreed to shift her field a little. Redislet wanted to help Horu to dig the hole for the well. Since Horu wanted to make Nero as soon as possible, she activated the mana cannon and created a high mana plasma cannon ready to fire. She located the water vein, shot it out with a plasma cannon, and connected it. When they checked the water it was also hot so they accidentally dug up a hot spring. Vale came and questioned what that was and who did it. 
Kidan told her to help him a bit. Horu noticed that Vale was a dragon and asked if she should kill her with the cannon she had. Kidan told her she was their friend but Vale was already furious and turned into her real form. He told her to help him put a pipe in the hole where the hot water comes from and connect it to the mansion. She said that she wasn't in the mood for that but when he said he would give her katsudan and dessert, she accepted it. Veal and the orc bow team prepared the pipes while Kidan and the goblin team prepared the bath. After they connected it it worked splendidly and Kidan shouted happily. It was a good thing they had a bathroom and drainage system other than the boiler. He didn't expect there would be an onsen in the land and was actually relieved. Platy now understood the logic of the bath and was happy that they could now cleanse their life. She asked who wanted to bathe and there was only two of them raised their hands because they got confused by the phrase cleanse life and Vale just wanted food first. Platy asked Kadan if he wanted to go in first but he wanted people to know the greatness of baths. Without delaying any further, Platy wanted to play rock paper scissors to decide. Vale didn't want to allow people who hadn't done anything to take advantage of her in any way so she told them to stop ignoring her. Redislet said that she shouldn't be forgetting that this all started with her giving away her land. Also the dug up hot water was thanks to Horu. Vale also questioned who she was and was not happy that the number of people who started to live there was increasing. Kadan explained that she was a Holkos phone angel. Somehow, Vale didn't like her and sensed the danger inside her body. Kadan then remembered that Vale's ancestors almost got annihilated by an angel. Vale wanted to fight with her outside but she stated that she would no longer fight. As she expected, something was wrong with that one and Vale questioned if she was a weapon or something. She approved her and said that she was a living weapon rather than created as an angel. However, she stated that it was in the past and she was reborn. She was an angel and the one who made and protected the Nato. Vale was even more confused and asked Kadan what happened. When he explained it the situation, she wanted him to not let her get near her. Kadan then noticed that Vale didn't look well when she heard the word Nato but she did have quite an appetite. After eating he was thinking about Vale and Horu being in the same area and hoped that there wouldn't be any problem. Now that they had a bath, he hoped that they would get closer together. Redislet came in discomfort saying that Platy wasn't coming out of the bath. He wondered what happened and started to head towards the bath. He saw Platy lying in the bath with her half-naked body. He closed his eyes and asked if she was okay. She said that it felt so good and she didn't feel like going out in a dizzy voice. Kidan was relieved that there wasn't any problem and she was just relaxing in the bath. When the girls see her relaxing so much, they also want to try it out and tell her to hurry. Everyone was captivated by the bath and was fighting to get in which made it far from a resting place. As a result of that, the girls asked him to expand the bath. He couldn't believe the bath became the source of the problem instead. He could not let it stay like that and had to make the bath become a place for everyone to relax. He came up with a plan but he needed both Vale's and Horu's power. He asked if they could lend him their strength. Horu was okay with it. Vale didn't want to work with Horu but she accepted just to be able to relax. Not only them, the other girls wanted to help. Kidan was happy and impressed that everyone wanted to help him. What was important was not the place, whatever the reason. Working together on a single goal was the best way to achieve it. They were all connected through that relationship. The demon team would make clothes and towels. The mermaid team make bamboo baskets and props. The elf team make a lot of pipe. And the goblin team would support each other and manage the field while spirits cleaned the house. Last but not least, the orc team would start building the giant bath. The construction of the super public bath began once each group was assigned their respective tasks. When it comes to building a super public bath, it would take up a considerable space so the place was important. Also, they have got to make sure the onsen's components didn't affect their farmland. A slightly distant area with a stiff geological structure would be best. Horu pointed out somewhere and asked if that area would be okay. That land felt firm and similarly, she was also detecting an abundant water vein deep underground. Not to mention that place was elevated level ground with an ocean view which made it the best spot to build their super bathhouse. Vale interrupted and informed him that the area below them was near to the lifeless king's dungeon, and his dungeon covers a pointlessly huge space. They couldn't let anything happen to his dungeon. The lifeless king appeared and stated that rest assured. Dungeons were spatio-temporal distortions created by the stagnation of convective mana. His cave dungeon also existed within a distorted subspace and was not actually underground. No matter how deep they dug, there was no way for them to come into contact with his dungeon. But that wasn't the point Vale was making. She wanted to confirm that he was okay with them using his territory to build a bathhouse. He was absolutely okay with it so Kadan thanked him and stated that he was welcome to visit any time once the construction was done. Now that it's settled, Vale turned into a dragon and was ready to fetch the facility they built back home and bring it there. Kadan was going to furnish the area himself while she was away. Orc team was ready to prepare the foundation and pipes with him, and elf team was in charge of plastering once Vale's back. He was also counting on goblins for the finer handwork. 
After giving their best, they successfully built a huge bathhouse. The lifeless king found it bizarre, but it was like the bathhouse of bathhouses for Kidan. Now for the final, Horu flew and used her blade that slays dragons and other slaughter gods to pierce the earth. Kidan was excited while Vale was concerned about the words she said. She dug up another hole like she did in the Redislet's field and the bath was done. They went into the bath with the perfect ocean view. The lifeless king stated that he made another splendid facility. He was feeling the hot water penetrating every nook and cranny of his body which felt revitalizing. Even his wolf Pochi seemed satisfied. Hearing the girls' voices, they understood that they were also soaking in the water. Platy was enraptured by the bath. Redislet wanted to show others who haven't taken a bath how to do it properly. Meanwhile, Vale jumped into the water without even taking a bath first. Redislet and Platy scolded her for cannonballing into the water. The bath was so good that they couldn't help but revert to their mermaid form. Platy knew it would feel great so she brought humanizing potions with herself. They were grateful but didn't think she should be doing that. They were more or less still convicts and they were there on the pretense of penal servitude. But it wasn't too bad to let them revert to their original forms once in a while. She doubted they would even want to go back to their old lifestyles. But they were dedicated to fulfilling their duties there because that was their long-cherished desire. Platy then wondered if life there didn't hurt their elven pride or something, but they seemed great even though they were also criminals too. They still had their elven pride in them but that was only possible because someone else values it as much as they do. It goes the same when they constructed that bathhouse. Kidan prioritized preserving the forest and decided to grow his own Japanese cypress trees to use as a building material. He teaches them the importance of a species survival through cooperating to understand and coexist with other cultures and environments. Retislet agreed with Aileron and said that she also needed to learn a lot more from that place, especially as Holly's sister. Bedemi finds it enjoyable that baths have a mysterious power. Who knew taking a bath with everyone would feel amazing? As Platy said. Meanwhile, Kidan was hearing everything they had been talking. Even though it was weird to hear, he was glad that they made that bathhouse. When he was about to decide to get out, he looked at someone who looked exactly like him. At first he looked like he was looking at himself but then he realized that it was Gobukichi. The hot spring was for sure had its own mysteries. After getting out of the bath he wanted to have ice cold milk. He had always thought they needed milk because it would even make a fine addition to his cooking repertoire. For example, butter, cheese, cream and yogurt would add variety to their food and they could also make confectionery with it. Kadan asked Platy and Vale if they knew that the world had any milk. Vale didn't know what exactly to make yet, but she was obligated to get her hands on some. Platy said that this world had organisms that produce milk, but if they were going to get milk, they needed to get the finest one. So she asked Vale to give them milk. Vale and Kadan were looking at her like she was crazy when she told Vale that dragon milk was the world's best delicacy, and gourmets all across the world drooled at the very thought of it. Vale couldn't produce any milk, of course but she had an idea as to where they could get milk. She decided to bring them the finest milk with her own hands and left there. Six days passed and she returned. Kidan was worried and wondered what she'd been up to those past six days. When he was about to scold her, she showed her the girl she brought with her. Apparently, she was one of those creatures that could produce milk. They were too stunned to speak and she wanted them to praise and feed her with delicious food. However, Kidan scolded her for being an idiot. Vale fell on the ground with extreme sadness. He yelled at her for randomly kidnapping an innocent person just because he said he wanted milk. The girl she brought said that he got it all wrong and stated that she accompanied Lady Vale of her own volition which made him surprised. She explained that Vale saved her race from peril so she wanted to repay her somehow. Aileron came and explained that she was a satyr, a kind of Therian's rope. A satyr community was located in alpine areas surrounded by steep rocks and therefore it was not some place ordinary demons or humans could enter, and it was said that they lived in peace. She approved her and continued to talk about how a dragon suddenly attacked their community. When everyone else stared at Vale, she saw that it wasn't her. She said that another dragon was already there, and he was after the village treasure, Golden Goat Fur. It was the same reason when he looked for a wicked holy sword since it was one of the trials given by her father, the geyser dragon. Kadan made a logic in his head and asked if the dragon who attacked their village was one of her relatives, which was obvious because he was a dragon. Kadan asked the girl if her village was alright as dragons were one of the world's strongest calamities. She said that he decided not to engulf their village in a sea of flames since he was just after the fur. Still he sealed the few entrances their village had got rid of any water source and burned down their meadows. He was cornering them bit by bit. Then, just when he was about to get what he wanted, Vale arrived and beat the dragon in exchange for sharing their milk with Kidan. Kidan wasn't sure it was okay to beat him up like that, but she said that dragons were after the seat to become the next dragon emperor. 
If anything, it was convenient to have more eliminated candidates. Besides, that guy had a crap personality and didn't deserve to be the emperor. The girl was grateful that she saved them from the brink of death all for an easy task in return. So that was the story of how she came to fulfill his wish. She then introduced herself and her name was Panu. Kidan welcomed her and asked if she really would be providing them with milk. She smiled politely and promised to do her best while pointing at her breast. Elves and the others were so happy that they now had milk. Elrin whispered to him that satyr milk was one of the finest quality, and it was also quite delectable. Vale was impatient and wanted to eat something with that delicious milk. Before that, Kidan apologized to her for doubting her. He promised to prepare the best milk for her and told her to go take a bath first. They then required Panu's milk. He told Elrond to make glass bottles. Platy was in charge of the fridge. After a while, the first bottle of milk was done and Vale tasted it. She was fascinated by the taste of the milk, and ice-cold milk right after the bath felt so good. Others went to wash and Kidan thanked Panu for the milk. Thanks to her, their farm's diet had become even richer. But with Panu alone, making her provide milk for the whole farm may be too much of a job, so he asked if there were many people from her race who could produce milk. She said that dairy products were the Satri race's specialty. Not only did their village sell milk, but they had also developed various processing methods so they could barter it with other races. Kidan was impressed and that gave him an idea. He told Vale that the bread and pizza she had always loved eating would become drastically more delicious now, and asked if she wanted to eat them. She was crazy about the pizzas too he asked if she could deliver their farm's products to the satyr's village. Their village must be in a crisis right now and he was sure they were having trouble managing their food. Vale didn't need any more explanation and accepted his request. He stated to Panu that they were hoping they could continue to receive her milk once their village's situation returned to normal, because having milk was a huge help to them. In exchange, they would also send goods from their farm. As a bonus, Vale could also become their village's bodyguard. Panu teared up and was so grateful to Kadan. Vale smirked and said that she was looking forward to her cooperation as he was eating more than anyone else. Kidan was so happy that their pizza crust would be loaded with cheese from now on. Vale heard him and her mouth watered even though she didn't even know what a cheese was. She brought Panu and the goods from the farm and headed to Panu's village. Others tried out the milk and were flipping over it. Their farm was able to produce daily products, but what the bath construction brought them was not limited to that. While Kidan was enjoying his milk, Orkusfin came to discuss something with him. He thought she was having trouble with Nato. However, she took out a literal head. Kidan freaked out and questioned if that was the head of someone who had died an unnatural death. Orkosfan told him to calm down and explained that this was an angel's head. She presumes the same model as she was destroyed by the gods about 4,000 years ago. He wondered why it was there. Apparently, she found it buried underground during the hot spring excavation. Kidan was too stunned to speak. She mentioned that she found no damage to the cognitive subsystems in the head, and she believed that it could be revived by repaying it, which sounded bad for Kidan. Since Kidan managed to restore her half-destroyed state, she was hoping that he could bring her back to life even in that state. He did not seem to like that idea, so she tried to comfort him by showing the unearthed parts. He felt like he was witnessing a brutal dismemberment case but then noticed that the parts didn't seem to go together. She affirmed him and said that after scouting the area, that was what she was left with after carefully selecting the parts that could be reused. Each part actually belonged to different angels and she wanted to join them to form one body. Kadan wasn't sure if they could really do that and didn't think they should be doing this without Hades' consent. Orkosfun stated that she was an ally whom she finally reunited with after a thousand years, which made him feel some things he couldn't express. His hands started to itch to create something. He got the message and said that he would give it a try. While working on the pieces of the angel, he thought even angels should have a conscience of their own, and it wasn't like they asked to be bioweapon. After working on her for a while, he managed to pierce the parts together. The Hand of Supremacy, a divine gift he had received from the gods, was incredible as it assembled random parts like that. Orkosfan thanked him and stated that her friend was now revived. She saw no problem and her power system was functioning and mana was flowing throughout the body. She started to count down from 10 to 0, and when she was finished, the angel woke up with incredible joy. When she noticed Horkosfan, she greeted her and Horkosfan congratulated her on her revival. She then recalled how she was being killed by a dragon, which was not pleasant to listen. She didn't get what was happening, but that situation made her laugh. Kadan asked her what they should call her, as her everybody part was from a different angel. The angel thought that made her an awesome angel. Horkosfan stated that the angel's behavior didn't correspond to any of the parts that were used and claimed that her fusion had led to twisting her personality in the process. Even though they couldn't tell who she was, she was happy to meet with Horkosfan again and hugged her. Suddenly an armored man came and stated that he assuredly resurrected one hell of a thing. Kidan asked who he was and he introduced himself as Hermes, the god of wisdom and knowledge belonging to the celestial realm. Everyone was taken aback by him and Kidan wondered if the lifeless king summoned him. 
Hermes said that he was a messenger from the gods, so he was more flexible than the other deities. He could descend upon moral soil without needing to be summoned. He asserted that Kadan knew exactly why he was there. He guessed it was because they had resurrected an angel. Hermes was certain that Hades had told thee of the horrors of angels, and that one angel alone contains a menace capable of annihilating the earth. Originally such ordeals were the domain of Hades and the other earthly gods, but because angels were created by a celestial god, they have a responsibility as well, which is why he was present. When Kadan asked about the angel that they just had resurrected, he said that it would be best to destroy her fast so that she could never resurrect again. That's how much of a threat angels pose. Kadan stuttered. Horkosfun apologized to him. She was an ally whom she finally reunited with after years, and if she were to experience another parting with her now, she would rather perish her. She kneeled to him and apologized again, for abandoning her natto making aspirations so soon. Kadan was upset that he was having to destroy the angel right before they started to get along, and begged Hermes for another way. Hermes didn't mean to stun him when he said that the decision was made with pure logic and that even he was hesitant to destroy her. Furthermore, a precedent has been established in Horkosfan's case, which he cannot just dismiss and continue with the disposal of the lady. He didn't insist on destroying her but stated that it was unfortunate after seeing his skill, but he suggested he entrust the patchwork angel to the celestial realm. Kadan wondered what the celestial realm was, but he couldn't permit further mishaps for the sake of his uncle Hades and his ilk. The lady has many parts that cannot be made whole by the improvised repairs, and also needed a full-scale overhaul to excise any hazards. Kidan listened to him but wasn't sure if he should trust his words. He asked if that meant it would be done by Zeus, the creator. His own father, a clumsy man, could never achieve such a feat. He shared that his own brother, Hephaestus, was the god responsible for bringing existence to life. Though on the surface it appeared as though Zeus had created the angels, it was actually Hephaestus who had crafted them. The ten angels were launched 4,000 years ago under the orders and strict supervision of Zeus and Eris, the goddess of slaughter. He had heard that his own brother had completed the angels while shedding sorrowful tears due to Eris's incessant demand for changes and relentless lambasting. But that was precisely why he had such strong feelings for his masterpieces. He felt devastated when he discovered the angels had been destroyed which was assuredly why he would gladly undertake that job. He was surely able to turn that angel into an ally of peace. He then asked if he was okay with that matter and he approved him. Orkosfan also understood the situation and accepted it. The angel had no idea what they were talking about and what was going on. He explained simply that she would be going with Hermes. Hermes told her to come with him to the celestial realm as a friend of that world. She didn't know what was going on but was pleased to meet with him. Hermes promised to bid his own brother to do something about her personality too. He took the angel and was about to leave but Kadan asked if Hephaestus likes rice balls. Hermes said that it was his favorite and before he forgot he stated that he would be visiting him sometime soon and requested Kidan to prepare something for him. When they left, Kidan comforted Horkosfan that everything would be fine and he was sure they would meet her again. She also believed that they would. Kidan was looking at the sky, wondering if he would be able to meet with the god that gave him his magical power. In the next scene, Kidan, Platy, and her brother are sitting at the table, and there is a strange tension that makes him nervous. He was nervous that he would announce his marriage with Puffer right before Puffer entered the room to serve some tea Platy asked for it. The prince wanted Puffer to be a part of that conversation which made Kidan even more panicked that the thing he imagined was about to get real. Puffer also seemed nervous and didn't want Prince to talk about a specific topic. However, the prince took out a tortoiseshell shield and explained that he won the martial swimming competition held the other day. It was a petition that had been passed down for centuries among the merfolk. It was a war for the merfolk's honor. Males and females use different combat techniques. Mermaids battle with medicinal magic, whereas mermen fight with harpoons in their bodies. As a result, quicker swimming and skilled spear handling were necessary. Auxiliary procedures and armor were also researched. The prince went on to say that showing off their skills and efforts at the tournament and doing well was the highest honor for the mermen. It was actually the prince's first victory, so Platy said it would be his luck that made him win, but the prince got angry that his sister didn't believe that it was because of his ability. He stated that his first opponent was General Shark, and Platy couldn't believe he beat the ferocious general who was the current defending champion. He said that in the semifinals it was the previous defending champion, the Master Slayer Beltfish. And in the end, it was the living legend of the Mermaid World Master Pike. Platy didn't think he would beat him without using any tricks. He said that he played within the rules, but one of the secrets to his victory was that tortoise shell that he borrowed. That shield made from a shell was really excellent. It was strong and its roundness perfectly deflected and neutralized any lethal attack from the opponent. By withstanding the opponent's attacks, 
he was able to seize the opportunity to counterattack and win. He mentioned that it was thanks to everyone living there and Lord Saint that he was able to win that battle. Kadan appreciated him but above all he said it was his unyielding effort that was paid off. Kadan was impressed while Platy could hardly believe such a great achievement. More importantly she wondered why Puffer was so quiet. She confessed that she went to the venue to watch the match. Platy asked why she went to the ocean on her own when she was a prisoner, but Puffer blushed and mumbled that she just wanted to cheer for the prince. The prince commented that she was actually healing his injuries with her potions and helping him maintain his condition during the competition. Platy was angry while Kidan teared up by saying Puffer's efforts contributed to the prince's victory. Puffer was admonished by Platy not to romanticize her crime because coming out in public was already an issue, and hanging out with the prince was a great scandal in the mermaid kingdom. Apparently they were already seen together and the scandal was already happening. But that wasn't the problem. He had won the martial competition and completed one of the preparations to succeed his father and become the Mermaid King. However, there was still a sense of unease within him. He was unsure about his capacity to become the Mermaid King. It was because he won the martial swimming competition and was one step closer to the throne that he felt that way. Kidan stated that his people would feel secure if he became the king. He was strong and on good terms with the Demon King after all. The prince appreciated his thoughtfulness but he couldn't be satisfied with the current situation and felt that he must possess the dignity and charisma of the neighboring demon king. So he made his decision and decided to go on a journey to pilgrimage to reforge himself from scratch. They were all taken aback for a moment. Puffer wanted to go with him and Platy was worried but not for his safety but for the compounding tools and supplies he delivered from the palace. The prince said that he had already arranged for a trustworthy substitute. Platy was now fine with it while Puffer was not accepting his decision. She wanted to go with him but he kindly refused, saying they he needed her to look after the farm until he returned. He promised her to return as a man worthy of being the king of the mermaid kingdom. Until then he asked for her patience. Puffer accepted his decision even though she wasn't pleased. Platy was now trying to adjust the idea of Puffer becoming her sister-in-law. Several days left and the time the prince left came. Considering the dangers he might encounter on his journey, Kidan made him a good luck charm. It was quite an oddly shaped weapon. He based it on the image of a prince who enjoys sumo, munches on cucumber pickles, and has a shell as equipment. He then wanted him to allow to give one of his orcs to accompany him. However, he tried to refuse his offer but Kidan said it was important to have someone to travel with. He then accepted to have him as his ally and asked what was his name. Kidan hasn't named him yet but decided to go with Hakai. Puffer approached him and gave him a pendant. She wanted him to keep it with him at all times as if it was her. He promised to always wear it around his neck and with that he set off on his journey. Platy teased Puffer but she didn't seem like she was listening. She stated that she made the pendant she gave him and it was a portable waypoint crystal pendant. She had been pushing herself to the limit of learning and mastering that until today and that was teleportation magic. As long as the prince had it, she could teleport to wherever he was. He took out a potion and slammed it on the floor. She disappeared after saying that she would come to make the pickles later. Everyone was surprised by her sudden disappearance. Teleportation was originally a spell from the demon race. They couldn't believe she was able to infuse their alchemy into the mermaid race's pharmaceutical magic. Platy was also shocked because it was an unprecedented historical event enough to overturn the Magic Research Association. She was also impressed by her power while Kidan was sure that it was due to the power of love that helped her succeed in something like that. Belena was blown away by the fact that a mermaid mastered the teleportation spell that she shed blood, sweat, and tears for just to become an elite. While they were talking, Puffer came back. They wondered if she had met Prince Arowana and she said that he was pretty surprised when he saw her. Apparently he was visiting the demon castle so she came back to change into something more appropriate for the journey. She left them to change her clothes. Belina was now feeling even more jobless that all she could do was to turn the spinning wheel. Kadan came and called for Betami as he wanted to show her something in the dressing room. He made a mana metal pedal sewing machine. He explained that pressing the plank on her feet starts the machine belt and moves the needle attached to it. It was a tool that lets her sew clothes. He thought it must be hard for her to make clothes on her own and having a machine would help her work more efficiently. She was still in shock that she could sew in that machine. He showed her how to do it and the girls were bewildered. Kidan asked about her opinions about the machine and was thinking how happy he would be if she liked it. However, she was mad that with a machine like that, no one would bother mastering sewing by hand anymore. She was yelling how efficient sewing was with the machine while making a shirt. But what she really wanted to do was to design unique and creative clothing. Then an idea came up to her mind and he asked if she could hole up in the sewing room as she wanted to try something. He was glad that she changed her mind about the machine and they were wondering what she would come up with. Several days later, Betami finished making leather armor. 
She said that the elves made armor from tanned monster leather. Aileron explained that the elves' value speed so heavy armor was not preferable for them. However, leather armor was light and its defensive and mobility abilities were excellent. She also made for Orkubo's team. Kidan was impressed and asked where she got all those unique ideas from. She added as her best maid a gauntlet that could emit flame magic. It has now seemed like they had gone beyond mere fashion design. Betami was so happy that she could make things she loved. She thanked Kidan as she had never left like that in a long time. Puffer was back with some news and asterisks. Betami and Belina were happy to see her. Betami explained the new things she could do with the machine Kidan made for her. Astra stated that it was the perfect time as she wanted to ask for some clothes, which was why she came. Puffer wanted to give the big news and said that Astra was expecting a baby. Everyone was shocked and happy for her. They congratulated her and asked about her health. She was healthy but as her belly grew bigger it was harder to move with her clothes so she wanted to ask for some clothes that could fit her. Also she wanted to make her maternity dresses. Betami was honored to do those clothes for her. Astris always appreciated her for giving up her dream of running a tailor shop in the demon capital just to serve her. Kidan was watching them and had an idea. He offered to sell the clothes Betami makes in the demon capital. Astris always knew about Betami's flair for fashion and was sure that it would be a hit even in the demon capital's social circles. Betami wasn't sure about that and was hesitant. Astris said that she could take some of her creations back with her and ask her contacts in the castle to find buyers. That way she wouldn't need to leave the field and they could keep its existence a secret. She was still unsure that her work would be appreciated. Belina held her hand and told her to not give up on it this time. Belina was regretting that she wasn't appreciative enough of her sister. Batemi made her decision and decided to do her best with all her heart and soul. Platy and Puffer were also excited about the new dresses she was going to make. Kadan found it valid that everyone wanted to dress up and feel fancy. Belena also wanted to make some clothes, but Astris told her to not push herself. Still, it sounded like a good idea to share some of Batemi's workload. With that, Kidan realized that they would need to expand the cotton fields and silkworm farms and introduce new systems. He asked Belena to take charge of operating the spinning machines. To operate many spinning machines, her psychokinesis would be invaluable. She gladly accepted to be in charge of the machines. And with that one incident, a Batemi sensation was about to sweep to the demon capital. Batemi was brainstorming design ideas for Astra's dresses and the ones to be showcased in the demon capital. Meanwhile, Puffer again went to see her precious prince, leaving everyone helpless. In the next scene, Kidan was at the altar of Mr. Gephist, and Platy brought some Mentaiko mustard onigiri to present it to the god. Kidan mentioned that he actually couldn't figure out how to build the sewing machine he built the other day, and was wondering if he could extract any wisdom from the process so he decided to rely on himself and pray. And that was how the blueprint came out of the altar. Platy stated that they seemed to have a good relationship. He put the onigiris and prayed to Mr. Geferist. Meanwhile, Mr. Geferist was enjoying the onigiris Kidan made for him. Hermes came and asked about the situation with the Zero case. Hermes apologized for making him build a temple to imprison Zeus. Hermes had doubts that his stupid father would break the barrier even though the temple was chained. Geferist said that it wasn't just a chained temple. The temple was surrounded by other temples in between which the latest models were built. He also finished tuning that angel Hermes entrusted him with. He told him to follow him and went to show the angel. Hermes wanted to make sure he cleaned out some of the weapons and replaced them with new ones and Geferis said that he was finally starting to give preference to convenience over destruction. He then pushed a button to activate her, and while she was activating, Hermes wondered what happened to her broken personality. His thoughts were answered the moment the angel woke up. She thought she was seeing two grim faces right after she woke up. When Hermes was about to ask, Geferis said that he didn't make much of a difference in her thoughts. It was her original acquired identity, and her fate depended on her character. He couldn't just entrust her fate into the hands of others. Since he wasn't going to change her personality, as the god of wisdom Hermes, he decided to restore her character, which she found creepy. It was going to be a hassle to give back such an insolent girl to a saint, so he decided to use all his wisdom on that one to teach some basic rules of behavior. This degree of personality adjustment was necessary for the acquisition of social skills. He told his brother that he was taking her with him and took her. Meanwhile, the prince, Puffer, and Hakai were walking out of the Demon King's palace as the welcoming ceremony was over. Puffer seemed to like the Demon King as he praised Atai. The prince was surprised by the pregnancy news of Queen Astris, but it seemed that after the experiences, the Demon King had continued to improve. He said that if he hadn't made enough effort too, he wouldn't have been able to touch all sorts of people and creatures of the earth, and his experiences wouldn't have changed his flesh and blood. Surprisingly, Puffer thought he wanted to be like his father. Hakai asked why he wanted to live on the surface. He explained that as a mermaid, he realized that the land was a dangerous place for him, but in reality, it was even more dangerous than one might imagine. Suddenly, an explosion happened in front of them. Something fell from above and it was the god of Hermes. He stated that there was something important to do and he trusted him in that. 
he asked him to take the angel with him on his journey. The prince was confused and asked who she was and he said that she was a 4000 year old reborn angel which made them all shocked. She said that she was in a fragile state which is why she must come with him on his journey. He thought she would have a great experience and would grow spiritually. He also mentioned that she could be used to him as well as her power was literally burning worlds. The prince accepted to have her. Raising a human being was not an easy job and he wanted to experience that too, as the next king of the mermaid kingdom. When he asked her name Hermes tried to think of a suitable name and came up with the name Songokfan. Her name sounded perfect for his trip and he introduced himself and the others to Songokfan. Songokfan didn't really get it but she was glad to meet with them, as always. Seeing her attitude, the prince and the others were now sure that it was going to be a rough ride. In the mermaid kingdom, the council was gathered and were discussing about Prince Arowana being on the land. The prince said he had been getting along with the outside world ever since, but they didn't think there was any logical reason for that. Their mermaid state remained the same as it was in the old days, and they all agreed that they should enjoy a peaceful life for the rest of their lives. One of them was sure that they would be attacked by the demons and exterminated like the humans, which was why they wanted to marry the princess to the demon king a long time ago. But the others were totally against that idea as they hated demon. A black-haired man who once before wanted to marry Platy asked what would have been the result even if the princess had already married to a representative of the human race. Nothing would have changed. In fact, it was a choose-nothing move. They avoid both better and worse choices. But for that reason, in order to control their own future, he thought they needed to think rationally about the mermaid kingdom. In reality, they had absolutely zero guarantees that the demons wouldn't attack. The man who wanted to marry Platy with the demon king stated that they should be going to King Naga's and ask him to negotiate with the demon rules. Even if they couldn't get Princess Platy, they could still give her little sister Enzel to the demons as a concubine. But the black-haired man refused that idea because if they start negotiating marriage terms with the ruler, it might look like a sign of submission. There was an unexplained anxiety in the mermaid kingdom and the mermaids would destroy each other before the demons even attack if that keeps up. He thought about going to Princess Platy as she was always more humble than Prince Arowana. He wondered if the princess could go out in a public place and show her face. He went to the land and was looking for Princess Platy. He was questioning if her husband the saint was real. If she married a non-existent saint he wondered at what point she decided to distance herself from the turmoil. He tried to focus on his goal of convincing her to return to the mermaid kingdom and negotiate with the demon rulers, even if it cost him his life. He arrived at the farm and saw the demon king but he didn't know what he was exactly look like so he didn't recognize him. He asked to meet with the saint and the demon king called for Kidan. While he was calling for him he wondered if he was a demon and if they actually lived there. Kidan came and asked what was wrong and called him the demon king, which made him speechless. The demon king said that he came to meet him and Kidan thought he was the guy Arowana sent it but he said he wasn't, and introduced himself. Kidan offered Hendola to take her to Platy and told King to take a break. While they were on their way talking about the fieldwork and laughing, Hendola was looking at them like they were alien. Platy welcomed Hendola and thanked him for the things he brought. Hendola mentioned the real reason he came there and said that the mermaid kingdom was in trouble. The country was in danger of destruction and it was unclear when the demons would target the mermaid kingdom. In addition to the insecurity there was growing dissension among the top leadership. He asked her if she could return to her homeland and took the reign. Platy didn't seem to understand the situation and asked the demon king if they really planning to attack the mermaid kingdom. The king found it stupid that they even asked something like that as they had no reason to attack the mermaid kingdom. The war with humans had not started by them. They were only defending themselves. They were just fulfilling the wishes of their rivals. Platy said that he was the demon king Zidane and he couldn't believe that. He then asked why there was a human child swinging a hoe out there. She explained that she was the princess of an extinct human country. Kidan then asked if the demon king and Arowana were good friends and he approved him. Andola was still in disbelief. He couldn't believe their prince not only knew the demon king but they were also friends. The demon king explained the goals of the prince and how he was ready to become king of the mermaids. Handola was shocked that Prince Arowana had reached the highest level of diplomacy without realizing it. The demon king apologized for causing trouble in the land of mermaids, but that was why they couldn't publicize that fact. When those who should speak up were silent, uninformed people started doing rash things. The prince wanted to reform the old system and now the demon king was waiting to warm that place and those people. Handola promised to remember their conversations and speak out against the rulers. Platy thanked him and asked him to not tell anyone about those lands. He was about to leave but Kadan asked him to stay for dinner. Platy was also excited that the mermaids living there would want to hear how things were at the home. 
She called for Gara Rufa and she immediately came. She introduced Handola to her but it seemed like they already knew each other and additionally, they hated each other. Handola didn't expect to see her again in a place like that. She seemed like she was pretty angry at him. Meanwhile, they were just wondering what happened between them. That is the end of the recap for now. Please read the pinned comment about the next part.